Space-based solar power. Space-based power. Safe, clean energy. The clean energy that we need. Space-based solar power. Space-based solar power. If we could do it, it would be a very, very high payoff. It's a life-changing, a game-changing type of capability. A potential for changing the energy game hugely. Collect the sun's raw, intense energy. Collect that energy in space and actually beam it down to the ground. Beam that power down to stations on Earth. And feed that as electricity into the electrical power grids that already exist. This is one of those ideas that not only goes to the heart of our energy problem, but to the long-term future of humanity as a spacefaring civilization. I'm Lieutenant Colonel Peter Gerritsen. I'm the Chief of Future Science and Technology Exploration at Headquarters Air Force. I'm Colonel M.V. Smith, although everybody calls me Coyote, from the United States Air Force. I'm part of an internal long-range think tank that thinks about 30 years out about the problems that America will experience in airspace and cyberspace. What we were looking at is what were the possible triggers for wars that could happen, and what could we do to avert them? And one of the coming crises that we saw was the increasing Earth's population with the decreasing sources of traditional energy, such as oil, coal. Our resources of energy on the Earth are limited. We realized that we had a source of energy that could be developed endlessly into the future. Now, would that influence the way you design the photovoltaic cells? At that time, we also discovered that a gentleman named John Mankins, who had led the NASA studies just a few years earlier, was in the Washington, D.C. area as well. My name is John Mankins. I am the chief operating officer of a company called Managed Energy Technologies and the president of a group called the Space Power Association. Space-based solar energy is an idea to go into space where the sun shines constantly, 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, and at higher intensity than it does here on Earth because it's not passing through the atmosphere, and collect that solar energy in space and transmit it efficiently for use here on Earth. Up in space, you would have large reflectors, two of them, that would collect the sunlight. You'd take the incoming sunlight, concentrate it, and redirect it using these secondary mirrors. The secondary mirrors would in turn reflect the sunlight down onto photovoltaic arrays, which convert the incoming sunlight into voltage, into electrical voltage. It is then converted into radio energy, and then beamed down to a receiver on the Earth. Well, the kinds of frequencies that are being looked at that would be used for beaming energy are approximately the same kind of radio energy as is used in a Wi-Fi system that people have in their homes, a wireless router or a, a, a cell phone. It's quite similar. When we met with people from industry, when we met with people from the academic circles, we discovered that there was actually wild enthusiasm. It would forever change uh, our relationship to energy, providing vast, liberating vast amounts of renewable energy. A typical natural gas-fired, turbine-based power plant produces something like 20 to 50 megawatts. A single solar power satellite would produce something like 40 to 100 times more energy than one of those plants. My name is Paul Edward Danfus. Uh, I'm a lieutenant colonel in the United States Marine Corps. I currently serve as the chief of advanced concepts at the National Security Space Office. I was asked to pick up the study on space-based solar power. Our next speaker is uh, Marine Lieutenant Colonel Paul Danfus. I'm pleased to announce that we're going to release our six-month study on space-based solar power. October 10th in 2007, we released our space-based solar power study. The National Security Space Office study was essentially the first major paper looking at what space-based solar energy might mean for uh, energy security for the U.S. There was a fairly significant turnout of press, but I think it was only the tip of the iceberg because what followed in the many months after that was coverage not only in the aerospace media sector, but the energy sector, the environmentalist sector, 
environmentalist blogs started catching on to this. We were actually called uh, the military space hippies, which, uh, you know, something I've never been called before. Uh, and then the mainstream media picked it up. So this thing really struck a chord and resonated from that one event on the 10th of October, 2007. Space-based solar energy is an idea invented in the 1960s uh, by a gentleman named Peter Glazer. Back to when O'Neill and Glazer were promoting this idea. One solar power satellite could supply as much energy as 10 nuclear power plants. It isn't restricted just to those countries which have oil or coal or natural gas. Improving the condition of all of humanity by providing them with inexpensive, clean, renewable energy. A global energy supply system. In the 1970s, when there were the oil shocks in the United States, there was a, a strong interest in alternative energy, including space-based solar power. But all of that was based on the technologies of the 1960s. And so you needed huge factories in space. The business case just didn't close. The technology just wasn't advanced enough. The whole idea that we would somehow go from, say, Skylab to building cities in space in one step was so unimaginable. Another reason it failed, even in terms of research and development, was, of course, that around 1980, the prices of oil dropped. And so the impetus for any kind of advanced energy research collapsed. In the late 1990s, NASA went back and, and sort of revisited the whole topic of space-based solar power. And from that, one of the things that was discovered was that there were a whole range of new technical solutions that could transform how we approach doing ambitious things in space. But even though these new technical approaches were identified, in the late 90s, it was not a priority. Oil is $13 a barrel. Power is uh, three cents a kilowatt hour. Nobody cared about uh, global climate change. Energy was going to be cheap and of no concern forever. And all of a sudden, 10 years later, all of that has changed. I'm Nancy Colleton. I'm the president of the Institute for Global Environmental Strategies. We help to promote the knowledge and understanding of space technologies that help us better understand the environment. The challenges that we face right now with regard to energy and the environment are so compelling. Looking at the energy problem. Where's that energy going to come from? Looking at climate change. Figure out how we're going to deal with a climate that's changing and how it's going to change in the future. We're facing an environmental contamination problem because of our consumption of carbon producing fuels. Increasing populations, dwindling resources. Energy is going to continue to be a major uh, challenge for the global economy. In the developing world, there's needs like, uh, just basic needs like clean water and power that are not always met. My name is Danielle Adams, and I study aerospace engineering at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. We've developed ideas with space-based solar power to help in the developing world. Ideas for how you can use it for transportation, for water purification, for electricity. Space-based solar power can be broadcast anywhere in the world. Think of what that means to places like sub-Saharan Africa that have no infrastructure whatsoever. Think about what it also means to people that are in disaster areas. And when you look at the kind of growth that developing nations and developing economies are bringing, you realize that it's going to take a lot more energy to fuel the world. Space-based solar power is one of those options that can, in fact, provide a substantial fraction of what the, what the global economy will need 20 years, 50 years, 100 years from now. If we take the 100,000 foot view of this whole thing, it's very large. 